was very active. And it wasn't until the late 70s, probably 76, 77, that um, I opened a bank account at Victory Savings Bank. And it was a black bank, and it was a reasonable place for us to go to open a, a savings account for Grow. Um, and I met Majeska at the bank. And I didn't, I knew of her, I knew that she had a reputation as a civil rights leader, but I didn't know her. And in the ensuing, um, well, until she passed in 91, uh, in the ensuing decades, a couple decades there, uh, I got to know her pretty well. Uh, I think that I know a different Majeska than a lot of people do, because we had discussions on levels that were um, graduate level political science. Uh, I would be reading something about perhaps some splinter group of the Angolan freedom fighters being supported by uh, the Cubans and would bring, bring that up. I'd go to Majeska's house and we'd open a bottle of port and be talking about the events of the day and would mention something and and she would know the names of the people that were negotiating with the Texaco oil company rig that the uh, Angolan rebels had seized. I mean, she was just amazing in terms of her international understanding of politics and in detail and and uh, and current. She was up on things and she wasn't living in the past by any means. I think that what I was fortunate to kind of be there at a time to capture um, Majeska's activism in what we say post-civil rights. Uh, it's hard to say when the civil rights movement, you know, uh, ended. I don't think it's ended yet. We don't have equal justice for all. but. Most people would consider the signing of the, the, the Civil Rights Act uh, in 1964 to be the at least the, the high water mark, and things were uh, winding down after that with the, the implementation of uh, integration as opposed to battling segregation. And Majeska is revered now and known in South Carolina um, for her work during the Civil Rights era. But what I, I want to see captured about Majeska is the consistency and continuity of her global analysis of the problems. Um, she would bridle at being called a civil rights leader. She was a human rights leader. She went beyond the, the, uh, the notion of, of um, black equal rights in a small southern town. Uh, early in the game, in the, the 40s, uh, 1940s, she was involved with uh, a pan-Africanist movement that had uh, an understanding of um, imperialism and capitalism and those kind of classic economic and socio-political forces and the way they affect um, global economy and societies and the big picture. Majeska got the big picture early in the game. And that during the, that particular civil rights movement time, I'd say in the 40s, the 50s, and the, and the 60s, she was fearless in fighting for equal rights and civil rights and human rights in South Carolina. And she also had at the same time a, um, a sound basis and understanding of the economic realities that went along with civil rights. Uh, I, I draw analogies between her and Dr. King, both in their analysis and in their treatment by their contemporary colleagues at the time. Um, after the big march in 63 in Washington that King really rose to national prominence in, he, he started talking about economic justice. and. It troubled a lot of your mainstream um, civil rights organizations. The NAACP had already distanced himself from King. Uh, the Urban League and um, 
other big national organizations when King started talking about the war in Vietnam. He talked about imperialism. Um, you, you, he just kind of fell off the national radar screen. Uh, they call it the, the forgotten years of King after the, the um, march on Washington. But I see Majeska having those forgotten years uh, kind of almost scattered throughout her life in terms of her analysis putting off her contemporary allies. In the late 40s, she hosted a, a um, Southern Negro Youth Conference. I think that was the name of it. At the Township Auditorium with, with Paul Robeson. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois gave what is considered one of his finest speeches uh, at the Township Auditorium in Columbia uh, in 1946. And Du Bois was a, uh, had a global perspective and pieced it all together. And, and there were the, the uh, involvement of, of communists that were either uh, actual members of the Communist Party or people that had a, a, um, a socialist or Marxist analysis, economic analysis, were very prevalent in the um, civil rights movement in the 30s and the 40s and were actually the... the um, there was a, a level of civil rights struggle that took place in the South uh, uh, well before the black ministers got involved, uh, going back into the, literally the teens and, and 20s when the unions were being organized by communists and were doing uh, work um, against Jim Crow and having uh, integrated, fighting for integrated workplaces uh, decades before there was a recognized civil rights movement. And Majeska comes out of that school. And uh, uh, where I come into her picture is at the wane of the civil rights movement. I really, I mean, I was involved just on the tail end of the civil rights movement, having been uh, a Southern Student Organizing Committee traveler uh, for South Carolina in 68 and 69. But the civil rights movement for certainly for white middle class guys uh, was losing its its primacy as the Vietnam War was cranking up. Uh, the um, the war certainly overshadowed uh, the previous decades local fights for black equality. Uh, it was certainly a, a strong anti-racist movement within the the um, anti-war movement that Majeska was certainly aware of and, and she spoke against the Vietnam War in the 60s and uh, had one of her radio speeches censored in its entirety when she came out against the, the Vietnam War. And that when I met her in the mid to late 70s, the issues of the time, um, they were um, imperialism uh, that wasn't a whole lot different than the imperialism of her youth uh, with our American involvement in Central and South America. Uh, South Africa, the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, Majeska would come to, to, to the Grow Building, this wonderful old building that we had for nearly 20 years in Colombia, uh, and be engaged and offer the strategic thoughts and I uh, would go to her house uh, and enjoy much the same um, discussions with her but she was that fighting spirit that she had and that analysis she had that that led her into and through the civil rights movement was the same analysis uh, and insight that she applied to um, in American imperialist adventures in El Salvador, Nicaragua, uh, the South African apartheid fight, uh, the environmental fights for what we call environmental justice, where we were protesting uh, the, the chemical dumps, toxic waste dumps being cited in poor black neighborhoods. And she was involved with the work that GROW did from probably 78 uh, until she passed in, in 92. And spoke at rallies that we had. She spoke at the rallies at the bomb plan about nuclear weapons and nuclear waste. Uh, she marched with us against um, dem in demonstrations in, in Colombia about um, Americans 
American efforts to destabilize uh, Nicaragua and um, supporting the, the oligarchs in El Salvador. Uh, she marched with us at, in front of the banks when we were protesting apartheid, uh, spoke at rallies at the bomb plant. And the, it wasn't out of sync for her to be doing that. And she, she never lived uh, in the past. Uh, she, she wasn't living a, a retrospective life. Uh, she was always moving ahead and applying that which she'd learned in the past to that which she was doing in the future.